Good day, I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, July the 14th, and we've got CEO Nick Bitterswick of UGE International. UGE develops, owns, and operates solar projects. Please remember, this is neither recommendation or investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Nick, welcome back. It's good to have you here for an update. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning, Martin. Great to be back and doing well, thanks. How about you? Good, thank you. Uh, you just issued a news release two days ago highlighting the quarter's backlog, operating prop portfolio, project financing, and some other metrics and, and news events. Um, what, what do you see as the, the big uh, takeaways from uh, the, your second quarter? Yeah, sounds good. So like you said, this is our, our second quarter uh, business milestones update. We put these out every quarter. Um, and I think at a very high level, the big update here, number one is our project development backlog, which we track on a quarterly basis. Um, that grew the most it's ever grown in one quarter. So that uh, that grew to 195 megawatts at the end of Q2. Um, but then in addition, you know, the project deployments of the, the projects actually being built out, that's really starting to ramp up too. So we had a couple projects come online and, and some other uh, milestones for some projects that will be built soon. Uh, and then um, we also were, we're pretty active on the project finance front. So we closed a project finance facility and have been pretty active on the, the project green bond side of things as well. So your backlog, it, it, two things, things fall into the backlog and then things fall out of the backlog. A, once, at what point when you start building it or once you, you complete the project, does it sort of come out of the backlog in, in that way? Like what was sort of the in versus the out? Or do, you, do you have that kind of granularity? Yeah, yeah. So when a project comes out of the backlog is when it reaches commercial operation. So, so right at the end there. Um, yeah. And so on that basis... There were two projects that we we wrapped up in. Uh, I think it was. I think they were both sort of right at the end of June there, uh, and together that was uh, about three quarters of a megawatt. So you know, compared to the 195 megawatts that we ended the quarter uh, with our with our backlog, um, it was a, it was a small piece. And I think that speaks a bit to the overall funnel here. We have a lot of projects that have been added to the backlog the last year or two, um, and we're starting to see a more material number come out the other side. All right. And, and what's driving the, um, the big growth in the backlog? Are, are you, let's say, gaining market share or is the market just expanding uh, that much at this point? It's, uh, I, I think it's a bit of both. So, you know, in reverse order, the market is, is definitely expanding in a very big way. Um, and, and UGE, you know, we, we took some steps to accept, expand the, the size of the company last year and, and ex expand uh, how much we could develop as well. So, you know, for us, um, you know, the, the, the backlog growth in Q2 was driven by uh, Massachusetts more than anything. That was a market we announced we were entering November of last year. Um, and at that time, we didn't have any backlog in mass, but we had a number of initial client commitments. So, We've been working throughout this year to, to move those projects through and add additional projects to uh, and, and see those move into a backlog. And, and just as a reminder, you know, backlog is a point where we, um, you know, it's, we, we, we have site control. We have a contract with the client. Um, we filed for interconnection. Um, and there's a few other steps we take, including passing our investment committee to say, yeah, like this is a project we believe is um, going to happen. Not that the projects before uh, before backlog, we don't believe, but it just had a bit more of a mature state when they enter our backlog. So Massachusetts was a big driver. Um, Delaware was another state that we added um, uh, our first project in. Uh, so that's an exciting market for us as well. Another good, um, uh, another good uh, community solar market that we'll look to do a lot more projects in. And then also in our sort of one of our core markets in New York City, we added uh, a few projects as well. On the sort of the, the, the general size of the market, uh, are there any things that are particularly driving it? Is it just sort of the, the green initiative? Are there government programs? Uh, there's a lot of volatility in the financial markets and in the energy markets as well. Are, are those things helping or hindering uh, the, the, the growth? You know, I think there are a number of tailwinds. Like I think you mentioned a few of them. You know, we could probably mention you know, a, a few more as well. But I think that there's like a number of good tailwinds that are driving, driving this. I think that if I tried to like sum it up as, as succinctly as I could. I think number one is like this community solar space that we're in, um, you know, Department of Energy has a goal to grow at 8X in four years right now. So it is growing incredibly fast. And that's on the backbone of, you know, like, like we like to say, you know, about 80% of households and well over 90% of businesses can't install solar themselves. So as solar costs have just come down more and more over time, um, it's gotten to a point where that, um, that like there's a there's a lot of support, a lot of growth in community solar. 
And then I think the other the other piece that's also a, a pretty ma major specific tailwind is on the battery storage side of things, um, which a lot of our Massachusetts growth has a, a has a large battery storage aspect to it. Um, and and what's the driver there? Like battery storage costs have come down so much. Um, the 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 amount of renewable energy on the grid and 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 and, and so on um, is increasing. Um, and so battery storage is starting to play a real important role in um, in in our business and in the industry as well. And so like in Massachusetts, we're one of the most active developers, if not the most active in, um, in the again, distributed battery storage market there. All right. Still supply chain is a big um, news uh, in, in the news and inflation and, and so forth. How are you seeing uh, those elements drive the, your input costs, uh, the, the solar panels? Uh, can you get the equipment in? Uh, I believe uh, there, there's been some political news on sort of easing up uh, tariffs and uh, and uh, restrictions in the, the solar equipment market. Yeah, yeah. So in reverse order there, I think the biggest news since we spoke last was that um, the, the Biden administration issued a proclamation in essence saying no new tariffs for at least two years for, for imports of solar panels from Southeast Asia. And um, there's a whole backstory to it. But in essence, uh, there, there had been a, a petition that led to an investigation into um, uh, kind of, in essence, uh, sort of anti-dumping type of uh, type of a framework, uh, and so that had really gummed up supply of solar panels into the U.S. market from about late March until early June. Um, that proclamation was, uh, I believe, it was June six or seven, so so early June, and so in the last four to six weeks, we've seen solar panel prices decrease decreased by as much as 20%. So wow. we're seeing, yeah, so, so, so it's been really good for us since then. Um, and then I think more broadly on supply chains, you know, we're obviously working, all of us see it in our day-to-day -day, um, in an environment where, you know, stuff that you're just used to being able to get, you know, when you need it uh, takes a little bit longer. Um, our, our installations are typically, you know, as we've talked about over months or quarters. And so on that basis, if you need to wait a few extra weeks or something, it's not usually that big of a deal, but like, you know, there was a third project in New York that is kind of quote unquote mechanically complete. We've built out the, the system, but the utility who needs to do the final interconnection, um, they, uh, uh, you know, they told us, hey, we're, we're, we're waiting a few more weeks for, uh, for a piece here to connect it. So you're going to have to connect this in July and not June. So there is things like that kind of on the margin that, that, we're, that we're dealing with. But I think in the big picture, it's not been too bad. All right. And are, do you see like labor issues with um, like getting the right staff for your your uh, uh, equipment vent or your, your vendors who help do the installations and, and so forth? Or is, is there um, are people showing up to work, I guess I'm saying? Yeah, it um, uh, people are showing up to work, thankfully, um, and uh, had a company offsite on Tuesday, which was well attended. But um, the uh, I think like in terms of the, the the labor to build out the projects, which we subcontract, um, we haven't had any material issues there. Uh, so so you know we're we're ramping up the the construction quite a bit the second half of this year, and so hopefully that'll continue. But yeah, no no material constraints there. All right. And you announced some project financing, a $25 million facility with Twain Financial. Obviously, um, given the, the uh, volatility in the financial markets, they're, they're still funding for uh, green projects? Yeah, a tremendous amount. Like I think um, when we closed that facility, we had run a competitive process and, and had multiple term sheets end up choosing Twain Financial for that. So, so what that is, is... Um, uh, a number of our projects in Maine are just entering construction, will be entering construction in the coming months. So that 25 million US, uh, the non-recourse project level uh, financing um, was, uh, was, was, was the largest facility we've closed so far, the most competitive cost facility we've closed so far, um, and really allows us on that portfolio to put our head down and, uh, and, and build that portfolio out. And I think, you know, backing up, I think, you know, whether with Twain or maybe some of the other parties that, that provided us term sheets there as well, um, you know, we have a number of other projects outside of Maine that, that we'll look to start construction on in the next six months as well. So look forward to continuing to scale that up. But I think it is a sign, yeah, the, the, the money that's out there, but also, you know, hey, anybody that's that's underwriting a deal of that size. I mean, we go through you know pretty extensive due diligence on all of our projects and so on to get to that point. And um, I, I think it also speaks to you know the value of our projects as well. Um, I should say too, uh, 
you know, as each of those projects reaches the start of construction, um, we get a, uh, a third party appraisal on the project. So that was one update to uh, a couple of weeks before this Q2 milestones update. But like the first main project was appraised by a third party at uh, 262 a watt. Um, and uh, two dollars sixty-two cents U.S. per watt, and um, and that that project was pretty average. And there's nothing special about that one. And I I just bring that up because um, uh, you know you you apply that against 195 megawatts of backlog, you're talking about 510 million USD or so of project value that we're we're developing right now. So you know as a reminder, our market cap I think is about 22 million USD right now. So we feel we're creating a lot of value that uh, that that hopefully shareholders will will uh, will, will recognize over time. All right. And with, I'm just curious, with the, the Twain financial, you say it's project level financing. Does that debt show up on UGE's balance sheet or is it sort of further down on like the project itself? Yeah. So we, we do own and control the projects. So in that sense, on a consolidated basis, it does show up on our balance sheet. Now I will say the 25 million facility, we pull it down over time. So it's not yes. like we pulled it all down up front. Yeah. So that does show up on the, the consolidated balance sheet. But in our financials, we do break that out because it is it is materially different, like how it how it treats the company and so on, right? Like from an operating yeah, perspective yeah. versus the project perspective. And, and just crudely, if something goes wrong with the project, the the debtors, the the debt holders can sort of seize the project. They can't seize any like UGE itself. That that's essentially the difference. Exactly. Yeah. Not that anything would go wrong, but if something did go wrong yeah. on the project, that's they right. have it their is. clause on the asset, yeah. not on UGE itself. That's correct. Yeah, it's completely non recourse to the parent. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, a couple of things here. You also mentioned UGE engineering um, with 340 grand of new deals contracted. Is that, is that, are those outside parties or is that sort of internal work that you're discussing there? Yeah. Yeah. So to make a long story short, you know, we've been in this business for a long time and, and the sort of the engineering and consulting side of things, um, that business unit, um, does work for our own projects, but actually works for a number of other leading developers too, uh, you know, doing work to engineer their projects and, 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 and lend, lend a hand in other ways as well. So, you know, I think, um, in the first 12 months of this year, uh, I think, uh, it has about a million USD, I think, give or take of uh, uh, or 900 and something thousand of, of new business that it's brought in. So it's been doing really well. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, gives us, um, I think, a real leg up on our competition and also gives us some, you know, pretty good, you know, intel into the market and so on, too, in terms of what's going on out there. Well, and I'm guessing it gives it allows that business to scale more and to have more expertise yeah. and 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 so forth. Uh, that then your the UGE projects themselves can leverage off of. Exactly, that's right. All right, and um, and then you're you're in the process right now of um, of raising some green bonds as well. Yeah, yeah. So we um. Uh, you know, I think we were quite early in, in getting into the green bond market back in late 2018. We did a first one um, and then we had no one for a while, but uh, we brought that back and, and closed one on April 8th uh, and had some kind of, you know, uh, additional demand that came in uh, around that time and after the fact. So, so we did another one um, that's closing here in the coming days. So Canaccord's leading that on a brokered basis. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, as we scale up, you know, we're very focused on, you know, we, we, we think that we're extremely undervalued here and, and, and therefore, you know, really managing dilution. Uh, but also we have all these assets that we're developing. And so that also gives us a, a good opportunity for us to leverage them. And um, you know, whether that's through project financing or the green bond product that we're talking about here. So, um, you know, feel we put together a good product. Um, you know, it has, a, it has a nice coupon, it has a little bit of warrant upside to it. Um, and also we're listing this, this new green bond for the first time. So, um, you know, just, just aiming to make it more and more, I guess, increase the addressable market for that over time. So, um, you know, yeah, thankful for those who are participating there. All right. And so the quarter just closed off. You'll be announcing uh, Q2 results in the back half of August, I'm uh, guessing. And that's uh, right. Yeah. yeah and news flow yeah. for the coming quarter will be similar stuff, backlog, new project wins, uh, that sort of a thing. Hopefully. Yeah, I guess you never know, but uh, but yeah, we'll have our, our Q2s in mid-August. Um, you know, beginning of every quarter, we look to recap in this in this fashion the the, the prior quarter. But um, we're definitely uh, we're definitely very active there on the on the project side, on the project financing side, and um, we're in a market right now, like we've talked about, with a lot of tailwind. So hopefully, we'll have uh, all sorts of updates to share.
All right. I think we hit the high points here, Nick. We should wrap things up. Anything else we missed or uh, you want to um, uh, shed a little additional light on before we, we close it up? No, yeah, I think that that captured it well. Maybe the one thing I, I'll also add is, um, and this was probably implicit what we were talking about, but you know, we talked about turning on a couple projects that were about three quarters of a megawatt and another one about the same size, three quarters of a megawatt turning on in July here. Um, but, um, but also you know, that 25 million facility, uh, we're expecting to be constructing um, I think north of 20 megawatts of projects here in the coming uh, couple quarters. Um, and so on that basis, we're really starting to see an operating portfolio pick up. And of course, with that, you know, we start to see that long-term recurring revenue hit our income statement as well. So I feel like we're at a pretty important and exciting time for the company in that, uh, per, uh, that basis as well. All right, Nick, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to talk with us. Looking forward to seeing additional news flow come out. Have a great summer and hopefully talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks, Martin. You too. Cheers.